Welcome back my steel design friends. In our last video we talked about the different types of strength equations that we needed to analyze for tension members. We talked about gross yielding and then began a basic discussion of net fracture and net areas. Okay, But we also said there were some caveats to calculations involving that value. In fact the net fracture case actually uses something called the effective net area and that's the purpose of this video. So without further ado, let's get started. If you recall, when we were talking about tension members, and in particular with the net fracture calculation, we were always over in chapter D of the specification. This was on page 16.1-28. Okay. The equation that we're looking at and we're most interested in has to do with equation B down in D.2, this guy, for tensile rupture. Okay, So for gross yielding, we had nominal strength was yield stress times gross area with a phi of 0.9 and for net fracture it was nominal strength was Fu times this AE value multiplied by 0 0.75 okay and if you go over to the next page then slide my keyboard out of the way here okay if you go to here this is what we're talking about now is this effective net area that AE that shows up in the net fracture equation is actually our net area multiplied by this shear lag coefficient or this u and so this lesson is going to be all about how do we figure out u and what is that actually telling us um, as we start to think about connection detailing and, and those kind of things all right so this is the purpose of this now the the, the heart of u um, the shear lag coefficient comes out of a table that's located on the next page okay and this is table d3.1 and we'll kind of go through a lot of these cases as we start to look there's a lot of information here and you've got to be really careful um, that of reading all of the key words in the cases so we'll spend some time and kind of run down through a lot of these of the more common ones and then we'll also show you that to understand this table you have to go back and look at the commentary section which I have pulled up here and that's back in commentary for chapter D just like we talked about there is a, a corresponding section in the commentary for every section in the white pages if you will remember these are the gray pages that we talked about in the last video okay so if we look down here um, the effective net area starts here and we have to do a lot of reading under the words to understand the terms and the variables that are being used okay and in particular we'll have to be careful of kind of understanding you know some of the basis of what you is doing they did over you know a thousand bolted derivative connection tests and found that their their um, that the results correlated to these values within a plus or minus 10 percent. Now this information has been around for quite a while. In fact, most of this research was done in the early 60s. Okay, but it's a kind of an ongoing kind of thing as different cases have presented themselves. And as we start to look, but the paragraphs that you'll want to pay attention to, in particular when it comes to I beams, will be the paragraph that's over here. And we'll come back to this and talk about this in a little bit as we start to kind of get a sense of what shear lag is. Okay, so this one, this video is more about what is shear lag, and then the next video we'll have to do with kind of deciphering the U table, and or the shear lag table, that table D3.1, and what can we do with it. All right, so let me get this out of the way. Okay, and we'll kind of start looking at some, some simple cases. What shear lag is, is kind of a, you know, when we look at a, at a tension member, if you will, you know, and I can kind of, kind of set this. Let's just take this a simple tension member. Slide this down a little bit here, and suppose that I'm pulling on this side with some load PU that's located at the centroid. Well, in reality, in tension, the entire cross section is typically being loaded with some portion of this of this load, such that the resultant is this PU guy. Okay, and if we look at you know, say just looking at the member itself, you know, to keep this in equilibrium, we know that we would have to have a PU over on the other side. And that kind of means that, you know, if I kind of trace these arrows, that they're kind of, imagine these are kind of flowing 
from one side to the other that they're kind of flowing in a straight line. Now again, this is a very subjective picture, just kind of the way I understand shear lag to work. That you know that it's you know that regardless of whether I cut here or I cut here or I cut here, every element in the cross section is being loaded exactly the same in this case. Okay, but what happens if for some reason I start to look at, you know, you know, I'm cutting out a corner or instead of going through the member out in the middle, we now look at some sort of connection situation. So let's pull up this guy. Okay, here I have an angle, you know, with a load on it. And if it's a bolted connection, say I have a bolt, a series of bolt holes down in one of the legs, but not in the web, then all of that load has to be resisted by shearing the bolts, okay, which are pushing on the leg, okay, and so now there's this eccentricity, and if we play that same little flow net game that we did up here and play it here, what has to physically happen is we start thinking about the load, okay, and since we don't really know, you know, if I take one of the arrows, I don't really know where it's going, I can kind of start to draw that you know there's you know a potential that it could flow to there okay there's a potential that it could flow to here and then there's a potential that it could flow all the way over to here as the last piece and this guy does the same thing he kind of comes down to the first one goes into the second one and goes into the third now again we have no way of knowing what's going on but you can see that if I do this for all of the arrows let's do a couple more you know as we start to kind of look at it there starts to become this artificial boundary here in which the load is trying to take the most direct into a bolt hole. Okay, this load is not going to go all the way over to the corner and then come back, right? It's going to take kind of a gradual approach into the bolts, the way the bolt connections are being set up. And so what happens is, is we get, you know, if this is kind of an area, what we call is kind of the effective area that is being loaded by all of those load arrows, if you will. Okay, now again, we don't know the rate at which these things curve. It depends on the dimensions of the beam. But what we do notice is that now we've got an area out here that is void. Okay, that's not getting as much load. It might get a little bit because pieces are connected, but in general, the most of the load is being loaded down through this shaded area. And if we go in, if you remember when we talked about the net area of this, we were taking that first set of holes, you know, and we were drawing a plane on this guy and that's my net fracture plane for this particular connection. Well, take a look at what happened. We now have an area of this angle that is loaded and of course there's some of the leg is being loaded as well but there's this portion of this, a fraction of it up above you know, from this line up to the top that isn't being loaded as much as the others. Okay, and so that's what the U value is trying to figure out. It's kind of coming up with a percentage of what area can we count on based off of these dimensions. Okay, so that's the case that we have happening here. Now let's go through and let's look at its counterpart. You know, this is kind of an extreme case in which I only have holes in one leg. Okay, let's take the same member now and put a second set of holes in it. Okay, maybe, you know, instead of doing three big bolts, I do six smaller bolts and I spread the load out across the cross section. And if we play the same game on this, on here, okay, well, what can happen? The load that's up here at the top could go in to the first hole, it could go in to the second hole, and it could go in to the third hole, and then this guy could come down to here, this guy could come down to here, and this guy could come down, you know, over to there and then all the others could kind of do the same thing but what you notice now is that before you know if we kind of look at our boundary again whoops broke my pencil head if we kind of look at our boundary that's happening here and kind of lay this guy in You can kind of see if that's my boundary line, then if we look at the net area by comparison, same spot, same hole, and we're assuming the holes are all spaced the same. That's my net fracture plane on this one. And by comparison, if we put this other one that we had back out there, again, these aren't quite this scale, but you can see now that by adding these bolt holes in here, 
I've moved that line up and now, so now my net area is, again, based off of the effective area along that line, the part that's not active is now smaller than it was before because I've spread the load out better across the cross section. Okay, and so we've bolted both legs to it. It's now working better to carry all the load. In fact, if you look out at this last hole up here, there's a significant difference in the amount of area that's working. Now, since we can't actually calculate that area, that's what U is attempting to do for us, the shear light coefficient. So, so you know, it's, um, this will have a higher tensile capacity than this one does. Okay, and so that's what we're looking at trying to do when we look at the, the shear lag um, coefficients and what it is that it's trying to tell us on there. Okay, so, so that would be for a single angle. If we go and we look at, you know, say an I-beam now, if I bolt just the web, this one's a little bit different. Okay, so now I've got an arrow that's here and an arrow that's here. You know, here are my stress arrows, exact same phenomenon that we had on here. But now we kind of break this, um, the SI beam because it's symmetric above and below as we split this guy at its centroid and say, well, all right, let's assume that the top bolts take care of the top half and the bottom bolts take care of the bottom half. Again, theoretically, whether that's right or wrong, it's not an issue, but we can start to kind of look at, well, okay, let's play the game. So let's take the arrow that is here down on just above that line. And so he's going to travel to that hole and he's going to travel to this hole and this one will travel to the last one. All right. And so our boundary would be something that kind of looks like this. Okay. And then all of my area that's, you know, this would be the area that's being loaded when this is a flange only connection because it's only the flanges you see that are being loaded. We don't have any holes in the web yet. That will be the next case that we look at. Okay. And then do the same thing for the lower part. And pretty quickly you can start to see that the load, you know, if we bring it down, it is trying to get to all the three holes. Okay. And so I'm going to turn this a little bit just so I can draw it a little faster. That looks something kind of like, you know, like that. Okay, and as before, now you've got a void area in here that's void, that's not being loaded because again, the bottom was being loaded here by the load as it tries to go into the bolts and the top's being here, but there's a big area in the middle. So again, draw your net fracture line. It looks something kind of like this. And what are the areas that are in the shaded regions? Well, I've got this region right here as part of it. And then I've got this region right here okay now and so obviously it's not the full net area the effective area is something similar uh, something shorter and depending on the depth of this beam if these things are really far apart i mean that open that area in the middle can really open up okay and which means that more you know less and less of the area is actually doing the work for me okay and so that u factor can approach values of like 0 0.6 Okay, as opposed to being, you know, 1.0 or something significantly higher as we start to kind of look at that. Okay, and then if we come through and take the same beam and we look at putting, you know, bolts in the middle, well, clearly now it's doing a better job. You know, again, do this one really quick because I think we've kind of proven our point on this. That if we take our load and say, well, now it's coming in and this load is trying to get to here, he's trying to get to here, he's trying to get over to the other hole and so forth and so on that you know that clearly you know just get all, we'll just get all of them on here real quick kind of where the load is trying to go that now based off of this this member is doing a lot more connecting you know if I draw my boundary line that it's you know there's still a might be a little bit of a dead area but it is significantly less than what you were seeing up here okay and then the same thing you know and here is my Okay, so this is a connection in which the flanges and the web both are being connected. Okay, and it is a much better distribution of the axial forces along the cross section. Again, there's my my up, and so this comes down and does something kind of like this. Goes probably a little below the hole, and then the same thing on the bottom. If you were to draw it, it'd do the exact same thing. And so you can see that this area is significantly larger than what would be happening in here. Again, I'm drawing it as lines, but it's actually the the, the portion of the area that's shaded is represented by this. And this is the cross section, as you start to see. So here, U is a higher value because now I've got a web 
and those kind of values there. That's the nature of what shear lag is. And so our attempt in, you know, in the next video will be to come up with quantities that represent the percentage of this effect, okay? Again, this is called shear lag. All right, that's what it's called. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the next video. So I hope that's kind of illustrated the issue that we have with our tension situation. You know, in gross yielding, the entire section is being loaded. That was the very first diagram that we had kind of back up here where everything's being loaded. We can count on all of the area. But depending on our connection orientation, whether it's a bolted connection or whether it's a welded connection or what have you, the way things are connected becomes a factor in the strength of the member. I mean, the main member itself out here may be all right, but we're going to start having problems back around these connections as all this force is being funneled in to smaller and smaller areas. You know, if the force is the same and the area is reduced, the stress has to go up. And we're, that's our basic mechanics principle at work here. So I hope that's made sense to you. As always, if, um, if you've got any questions, leave us some feedback down in the comments down below. And of course, be sure to like and subscribe to the video. And we will see you in the next lesson where we actually talk about, well, how do we quantify this? Okay, but conceptually, that's what it is.